we are in the book of Revelation, and we are more than halfway through with it. And the amount of things that we have seen in Revelation is absolutely astounding, is it not? Revelation chapter 14, we are hitting the last six verses. I feel like there's some reverb on me, Greg. Hook me up real quick. Um, we are hitting the last six verses in the book of Revelation, uh, for chapter 14. Give me, kill the reverb on my mic for me. We are Revelation chapter 14, and we are at verse 14. All right. It says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat, like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Okay, did you guys know that whenever the Bible says that there is one like unto the Son of Man, who were they talking about? They're talking about the Son of Man. They're talking about Jesus. When it says there's one like the Son of Man, that means I actually saw the Son of Man. So, remember how every week I teach you guys that all the prophets saw the same thing. Let's take a look at how Daniel saw what John the Revelator is seeing right now. Give me uh, Daniel chapter 7, and let's begin it at verse 13. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. 13 and bring the beat down just a touch before we start doing a dance battle because I will crump on all of y'all real quick let me see kill it okay watch this he says I saw in the night visions what does that mean what was he doing he's sleeping because all the prophets were sleeping I saw in the night visions and behold one like the Son of Man came with the clouds. Isn't that exactly what it said in Revelation? Came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. Who's the Ancient of Days? That's the Father. So Christ is in the clouds and he comes where? To the Father. It says, and they brought him near before him. Let's find out why the clouds are bringing the Son into the presence of the Father. Give me verse 14. The Bible says, and there was given him dominion, given to the Son of Man. Christ is receiving dominion. It says, and glory and a kingdom. What kingdom is that? That's the kingdom of heaven. How long does it last for? 1,000 years. Okay, watch. And the kingdom that all people and nations and tongues should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Why did I thought you said it was a thousand years? This is the importance of understanding the eighth day. See, because when the eighth day starts, is there time anymore? So whatever is in existence on the eighth day, after the thousand year reign of Christ, that is forever. And that's when the Father comes to earth and he shares the kingdom with Christ. We covered this. Okay, it says, his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Take me back to Revelation real quick. So now we get a little bit more information about why we see a, a white cloud and one like the Son of Man. Now this is what's interesting. Remember I told you guys in this selection of chapter 14 there is exactly seven angels. There's six angels and Jesus. He's the fourth here. Let's just take a look real quick Let's run it back for those that are just joining us. Give me verse 6. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. We're just, we just want to make sure that we're keeping track. It says, and I saw another angel, but this is actually the first angel that he sees in this chapter. Fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Okay, now give me verse 8. Because that's angel number one. Verse eight is angel number two. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Okay, so how many angels have passed so far? Okay, give me verse nine. 
And the third angel followed them. See, we're at the third angel. Because throughout the book of Revelations, all of these things take place. They're enacted by seven angels, right? What do the first seven angels do? Do, do, do? They blow the trumpets. And as those seven angels are blowing the trumpets, what's also happening? Seven more angels are pouring out the vials. Okay, but here in chapter 14, these same seven angels, they have multiple jobs. Okay, so right here he says, And the third angel followed them with a loud voice, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Right, so that's what that angel said. Now, take me back to verse 14. There's no more angels between verse 9 and 14. But when we get to 14, it says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. That's Jesus. Having on his head a golden crown. Why does he have a golden crown on his head? Because he is receiving a kingdom. And what do kings wear? Okay, that makes perfect sense. But watch this. This is kind of spooky right here. It says, and in his hand, what does he have? What's a sickle? Is that like anemia? Sickle cell anemia? It's not that? No? What's a sickle? Is it like what? Like a popsicle? <laughs> Nicole is back here like, I think that's what it is, Pastor. <laughs> it's a popsicle. What's a sickle? I, I, I prepared some pictures. Show them what a sickle looks like. <clears throat> This is weird. You guys ever seen this before? See, anybody ever watch Sons of Anarchy? The, the, the image on the back of their uh, cut is called a reaper. And the whole world, just like everything, they got everything backwards. Like, you know how they think Satan is all about fire? He lives in the fire and he burns stuff up with fire? That's fake. Satan don't use no fire. Who uses the fire? God uses fire all the time. Satan don't have no pitchfork. Who has the pitchfork? Jesus has the pitchfork. It's a winnowing fan. Okay, but watch this. This is the Grim Reaper. He's supposedly the angel of death. He don't have no sickle. The angels of God have the sickles. I think I have a couple more. So this is actually called a scythe. This is a long two-handed version. Give me another slide real quick. When you have it in one hand, what type of tool is this? This is not actually a weapon. What is this tool used for? It's gardening. But see, now you understand when the scripture says that we should beat our plowshares into swords. We turn our gardening tools into weapons. And then when he shows us the reverse, he says, beat your swords into plowshares. So all this is to God is a gardening tool. Okay, I think I have one more picture of it real quick. The long version, I just want you all to see that. So that's what he has. See, people don't usually picture Jesus like this. <laughs> He's on a cloud. He's just floating around. He got dubs on his cloud. He's just floating around looking for anybody with a sharp sickle. Like, what? <laughs> and what's he going to do? He's going to stick the sickle into the earth. And he's going to, what's it called? Reap. He's going to reap. When do we reap? During the time of harvest. Okay, let's keep going. Back to Revelation chapter 14. Give me verse 15. The Bible says, and another angel, what number is that? That's number five, angel number five. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. Who's sitting on the cloud? So he's screaming to Jesus, saying, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Okay. Give me Joel chapter 3, verse 13. A couple weeks ago, you got something? Yeah, go. He receives the multiple crowns after he has defeated all of the nations. So those multiple crowns that we find out about, we're going to look at those a little bit later. That happens at the beginning of the eighth day. After he has defeated the last enemy. What's the last enemy? Death. Okay, so we're going to see he does have multiple crowns. It's actually a progression. He comes, and he's, he's got one when he comes. He's the king. But after he defeats all the nations and the whole, all the kingdoms of the earth become his kingdom, then he has multiple crowns. All right, Joel chapter 3, verse 13. Joel is a prophet, 
And all the prophets saw the same thing. That's the reason why the precepts in the Bible work. They're all telling you their version of the same story. Take a look. It says, put ye in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come get you down. Get you down from where? You want the cloud. Get down from that cloud. Jesus, time to work for the press is full. Wait, what's the press? The wine press. We're going to get deep into the wine press tonight. He says, here's that tricky situation right here. You guys ready? The vats overflow. I said vats, but what does it say? Vats. Depending on who the publisher of your Bible is, you may have a V instead of an F if you're reading the King James. But guess what? If you're reading a fake Bible, you're not going to have that word at all. <laughs> the fats, the fats are the juice of the grapes. When the grape is fat, you crush it and the juice comes and then you let it ferment and that's how they create wine. But also the vat, the vat is the area at the bottom of the wine press that catches all the juice from the grape. So both of those work, depending on how your publisher has decided to translate that word. It says, for their wickedness is great. Okay, let me show you guys Jesus spoke about this time period as a parable when he was here on the earth. Give me Matthew chapter 13, and let's take a look at verse 24. He describes this exact time period. Matthew, what did I say, 13, 24? Well, let's get it. The Bible says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Verse 25, we're going to break it down at the end. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Verse 26, But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. 27, so the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? 28. He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we should go and gather them up? Give me the next verse. But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root also the wheat so you root up also the wheat with them now look at his instruction in verse 30 this is going to start to make sense let both grow until the when harvest okay let both grow until the harvest and at the time of harvest i will say to the reapers gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn now, this is a parable so that we, we know that this needs to be broken down, right? So let's just jump in the same chapter. Let's uh, have Jesus himself explain what it is. Give me verse 36. Let's start it at 36. Okay. Then Jesus sent the multitude away. He had to, didn't he? Because when he speaks to the multitude, that's when he speaks in parables. Without a parable, he does not speak to them. Okay? But he sends them away, and now it's just the homies, the disciples around, and they scratch in their head. They're like, man, I, was a, I don't know what you was talking about, Jesus. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. So now Jesus is about to expound and explain the parable. He's going to say, this is that, and this is that. Here we go, verse 37. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. Verse 38. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares, what are they? Man, the wicked one has children? Yes, he does. If you want to get into that, you need to come on the Sabbath. It's going to take a little while, but I will show you in the scriptures. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. 39. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. Here's the part that we need. The harvest is the what? 
The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the what? So now we know why John the Revelator is seeing these angels and they have these sharp sickles. Because what are they? They're reapers. What do they do? They thrust in the sickle and then they pull it back and that's how they reap. Give me verse 40. It says, As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. 41. <clears throat> The son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. 42. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. What's that furnace called? The lake of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. One more verse. Verse 43. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who hath ears to hear let him hear. So now we understand why. Take me back to Revelation. Chapter 14. Huh. See how the precepts work? You could be reading chapter 14 and you have no idea why Jesus wearing a crown, crown rolling around on a cloud and he's got a sickle in his hand. And why other angels are coming out of the temple and they're like, I got my sickle too. I'm getting in on some. Now you understand it's time for the reaping. Okay. Chapter 14, let's take a look at verse 16. It says, And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Who's sitting on the cloud? Jesus sitting on the cloud. He thrusts in his sickle. This is an interesting word. And the, and the earth was what? Reaped. What does that remind you of when you hear that word reap? I know, sons of anarchy, you like the reaper, fear the reaper. No, not that. Give me Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. It should make you think of this scripture, because this is what is taking place. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So Jesus, is payback time, isn't it? That's, this, isn't this the patience and the faith of the saints? That, that he is going to pay back everyone who troubled you. That's what you're waiting for patiently. We don't take vengeance on our enemies. What do we do? We have to love them. Knowing that if they choose to continue to be our enemy, the Lord will pay them back for all the trouble that they did to us. There's no reason for you to be upset or be angry at anything. He will do exceedingly above and beyond anything you could ever do. So I don't need to give vengeance on anybody. I just be like, bless you. Because I'm going to bless you and hopefully you're going to repent. Because if you don't, it's going to be all bad. Give me Job chapter 4, verse 8. Job chapter 4. This idea that whatever you sow is exactly what you're going to reap is all throughout the Bible. It literally starts in Genesis. The idea of sowing and reaping is based on one thing. What are you sowing? Because whatever you're sowing is the same thing that you're going to be reaping. This works in every relationship that we have. If I sow love, I get to reap love, right? If I plant fear, the only thing that's going to grow is fear. I'm talking about relationships now. Whatever it is that you're planting is what's going to grow in your life. Now take a look here. It says, even as I have seen they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness, well, what did they get? They reap the same. Job knew it. Job was a perfect man, one that hated evil. He knew whatever it is that I put out into the world, I'm going to get that same thing back. You know who doesn't know that? Some of us Christians, we don't know that. We think that we can sow evil and wickedness and gossip and backbiting and jealousy and animosity, and we can still reap a blessing. Does any of that stuff sound like a blessing to you? Nah. So why do we keep sowing it? Let us change what we are planting in our garden. Because what you plant in your garden will eventually produce fruit. Does that make sense? Now, there's only two different types of fruits. Actually, there's only one type of fruit. The other thing is a work. You had to work to get it. You're going to have to work to keep it. One of them is called the works of the flesh. The other one is called the fruit of the spirit. Only one of them is fruit. The other one is work. Why? Man, are you... 
you you working to tell lies <laughs> you're working to figure out how this lie is going to work without somebody figuring it out without somebody calling your bluff that's a whole lot of work ain't it that's exhausting the fruit of the spirit is it's easy it's, it's gentle it's it's simple it don't require that much it just needs you just need to be the authentic you in order to produce it amen well maybe not the authentic you maybe it's the new you maybe you need to be the new version of you like you guys know how in christ what are we i'm a new creature so a new creature should be able to produce new fruit because if i keep producing the same old fruit if i look back and i'm like man that looked like the same apple that i've been producing for the last 10 years and it's bitter and there's a worm in it how can i be new if i keep producing the same fruit does that make sense all right give me hosea chapter 10 verse 12 hosea I like to refer to him as the homie Jose. Jose, chapter 10, verse 12. <clears throat> it's not spelled with a J, Greg. <laughs> He's like, really? It's Jose. Look, watch it says, so to yourselves in righteousness. What's righteousness? Right choiceness. That means make the right choices. Every day you are going to be presented with different opportunities. And every single opportunity requires that you make a choice. And what choice does God want you to make? The right choice. That's why it's called right choiceness, righteousness. Okay, so to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. You know what fallow ground is? Have you ever seen like clods of mud in the desert? <clears throat> And it's like cracked and it's just brittle and it's hard and nothing can possibly grow in it because it has it's 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 not fertile soil it's it's been trampled under feet of men it's been baked by the sun he says you got to break that up see that's the surface you got to get deeper than the surface because underneath that dirt there's some good dirt but you got to go through the dirt to get the dirt out that's literally what it says what he says break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Amen. All right, Revelation. Back to Revelation. So the one sitting on the cloud, which is the son of man, he thrusts in his sickle and the earth gets reaped. Boom. What does that mean? That means every single thing that a man did in his life, he gets paid back for. What you sowed is what you reaped. Give me verse 17. The Bible says, and another angel, which one is this? It's number six. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. He's like, oh, that looks like fun. Let me get in. All right. Everybody's got their sickle. Give me verse 18. And another angel. What number is that? Okay. So, you know, we're getting to the end of this chapter now. Because this is the seventh angel, six plus Jesus. As I was studying this, I thought about the story of the man wearing the linen and how many angels, how many men of war carrying their slaughter weapons were with him. And then it snapped into place. There are six men that go in through the gate plus the man wearing the linen. That's the six angels plus Jesus. He has the writer's ink horn. He sets a mark on everybody's head. And the other six angels come through and slaughter everybody who does not have the seal of God. You guys remember that story? So he's always one of them. All right, I digress. Another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. A vine? This vine? Is this vine from God? Is it from heaven? It's a vine of the earth. For her grapes are fully ripe. All right, let's get into it. This angel had power over fire. Give me Revelation chapter 18. Uh, let's take a look at, no, Revelation chapter 16, verse 8. This one angel in particular is the one who has the power over fire. Watch, it says, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Does that make sense? 
That's the reason why it's just, he's the specific one who has that ability over the fire. All right. <clears throat> he said, take me back. We got to analyze this verse 18. Another angel came out from the altar. We know which one he is. He's actually the fourth angel, but he's being presented to us as the seventh angel here. It says, and he cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle. Oh, I'm sorry, which had the power over fire. He's crying to the one that has the sharp sickle who just came out before him. And he says, thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. The vine of the earth. Because think back to the story that we heard about the son of man. He planted the good seed. But who planted the, the tares? The enemy. Satan planted those tares. His vine is referred to as the vine of the earth. He says, gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. Give me verse 19. We're going to start get the explanation of this. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Let me show you guys what a wine press looks like. You may have never seen one. Everybody knows the idea of it. Go ahead and show them a slide real quick. This is what it's like. This is the surface of it. The wine press, in order for them to create wine, they fill this giant thing with grapes. You are looking at the surface of it. And as they're stepping on the grapes, they're doing their little dance step in here, boom, like this. It's pressing down the grapes and the juice from the grapes. What's called the blood of the grapes is being squeezed into the vat. The vat is what holds it all. Show them another picture because I want you to see how far the surface is from the bottom. So here, this little area here is the vat. The whole thing is filled with grapes. So when you saw the kids' feet, they're standing at the top level. You completely crush these grapes down because as you crush it, it gets flat. And then you start crushing the ones under and under and under. And you're pressing all of it down into this vat. Guess what? God has one of those. He has one of those. I have one more. Go ahead. Give me that one. Nah, not that one. That one I'll do later. That one's amazing. Check this out. Take me back to the Revelation. <clears throat> Verse 9. Verse 19. It says, and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Okay. He takes everyone, not us. We're from the vine of God, right? He's the vine, we're the branches. He's talking about everyone that's earthly, that's fleshly, that's sensual, that's devilish. He throws all of them into the wine press. And then what do you think he does next? He jumps in there. Boom, he jumps in there. And then what does he do? He, he walks on. Stupid. <laughs> Stupid. He's just in there killing it. Uh, wait. Okay, look. Watch. Give me Revelation chapter 19. <laughs> you guys are crazy. Revelation 19 and give me verse 13. See, I got that image in my head now. Revelation 13, 19. This, this scripture is going to make sense now. Watch. It says, and he was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood this is jesus ain't it where all that blood come from jesus and his name is called the word of god let's keep going let's get a little bit more watch this i want to find out why he's dipped in blood and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen white and clean verse 15 and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. We talked about that rod of iron many times, right? Hold that. Give me Psalms chapter 2, verse 7. Let's see the prophecy of the rod of iron. Psalms chapter 2, verse 7. We're coming right back here to that very line. But we need to go line upon line as we match these precepts up. Give me verse 9. Psalms chapter 2, verse 9. It feels like 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's 
vessel. This is a, a prophecy of the Christ spoken through King David. Back to Revelation. It says, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with the rod of iron. And he treadeth, here it is, the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Why is his why is he wearing a garment that's dipped in blood? Because he's been stepping in the wine press, but there's no grapes in there. Who's in there? Who? The sinners. The sinners are in there. All right, I'm going to show you guys a conversation that takes place in the book of Isaiah where the words should be written in red. You guys know there's no red words written in the Old Testament. Because Jesus was not on earth at the time when he spoke. The rubrication in the Bible is a very interesting thing. There are certain, certain publishers who publish the red writing and they leave some of it out. Then there are certain publishers who had, like, your Bible's red writing might be different than mine. Because they may not have considered that to be the word of Jesus if somebody is speaking the word of Jesus. So what we know we're King James, but what publisher you get is very important. This area that we're about to read, watch, give me Isaiah chapter 63 and give me verse one. I'm going to show you how this goes. It took me a long time to, to see this. The Lord had to reveal this. This is a conversation between Isaiah and the word. You guys know how the, how the Bible says, and the word came unto me saying, well, who's the word? Jesus, so he's literally saying, every time you read that, Jesus came to me, and this is what he said. The word came unto me, saying, but one time the word showed up, and Isaiah was like, wait, what is, what's going on? Watch here, he says, who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. Now here's the answer. I that speak in righteousness mighty to save who is it so isaiah the word of the lord comes unto isaiah and he doesn't recognize it he doesn't recognize this i i know that you just came from edom that you came from the capital city of idumia which is basra i know i saw where you came from but i don't understand why you are red it's who are you and jesus said it's me <laughs> it's me i'm the one mighty to save give me the next verse He's still not quite sure. So he says, Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? Wine fat is the Old Testament version of a wine press. Isaiah says, How come you are dripping in this red substance? I don't understand. I've never seen you look like that before. The word of the Lord never came to me and looked like this before. Give me verse 3. Let's see what Jesus says. He says, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their what? And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. Wow. You see the conversation. There's a question, and then there's an answer. A question, and then there's an answer. And at this point right here, you're like, man, I never heard Jesus say nothing like that before. He's supposed to be coming back with John the Baptist playing the piano with baby angels. And he loves everybody and he's bringing us all into the kingdom. Is that how he's coming? Absolutely not. Give me verse four. So for those who would say, well, why? Why is that happening? He answers and he says, for the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed is come. Who are his redeemed? Israel is his redeemed. All right. Man, that's, that's amazing. Take me back to Revelation. Now I understand what it means. In verse 19, it says, Revelation 14, 19, And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth. That's basically the children of the earth. And cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Now there's only one verse left in this chapter, verse 20. <laughs> That's crazy. That's exactly what I need to know right now. Give me verse 20. 
children are amazing. Watch this. The Bible says, and the wine press was trodden. Where's it trodden at? Without the city. And blood came out of the wine press. Why is there blood coming out of the wine press? We already saw the story. Without the precepts, you wouldn't know that he's thrown the people into the wine press and he's just in there stomping on them. Watch this. It says, even unto the horse's bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Show him the picture now. He tells you the blood. You know a bridle? That's the thing that goes in the horse's mouth. That's approximately between five and six feet high. The blood is going to flow out of the wine press across the earth for 200 miles, and it will be between five and six feet high. See, once you start figuring these things out, you're like, oh, there's a lot of people in there. Give me another picture real quick. Blood rises five feet high. Look, a horse ain't, it ain't no little My Little Pony <laughs> down here. We talking about a full grown horse and the horses can barely get through the blood as they're traveling. Because what did he come back on? He came on a what? On a white horse, on a white horse. And the angels that came with him, they came on horses too. Do I have one more? No. Nope. Take me back to Revelation chapter 14, verse 20. The blood is as high as the mouth of the horse for 200 miles. That's how long 1,600 furlongs is. Give me Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. I don't see anybody with it. I think, I think, I think Aaliyah had it on. So you guys know we have a shirt that says blessed. And there's a scripture on that shirt. What scripture do you think it is? Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. Watch what it says. It says, blessed are they that just have faith. Come on. What version of the Bible are you guys read in? All I need is faith. Blessed are those who live by grace. They don't say that either, does it? What does it say? Blessed are they that do his commandments. Man, they hate to hear about them commandments. All they think they need is faith. You can do anything you want, but keep the commandments. Wait a minute. Watch this. <clears throat> Finish this. I can do all things through Christ except keep the commandments. <laughs> don't say that. How is it possible? People trust in this verse. They're like, I can do all things through Christ. Keep the commandments. Oh, no, I can't do that, bro. Nobody can do that. What are you talking about? <laughs> what do you mean? You just said you just proclaimed your so-called faith and said you could do all things. I told you to do the one thing that he asked you to do. And you're like, nobody can do that. See, blessed are they that do his commandments that they might have that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Because where's the wine press located at? You guys remember? It's outside. Give me the next verse. Verse 15. It says, For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. That's what it means in that verse when it says without. The wine press is without the city. It's on the outside of the gates. I think, and, and I still have to share this with you guys because I guess some people can't actually uh, envision the kingdom. The lake of fire is in the kingdom. The people that are in the lake of fire, they are called the least in the kingdom of heaven. The people that are on the sea of glass, standing, looking down at the people in the lake of fire, those are the greatest in the kingdom. Does that make sense? Okay. But it's on the outside of the gates. It's not in the city. Remember, the whole world becomes his kingdom. All right. Uh, give me Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. Revelation 19, 15. We're going to look at one last verse. We saw this. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. What is that sword? It's the word. Is He's going to use the same weapon that he tells you to use to fight your battles. Isn't that right? That's amazing. So when you're getting dressed up and you're putting on, everybody wants to put on the whole armor. The problem is everybody ain't got all the pieces. How many pieces? It has to be seven. What does the world think there is? 
six. They think there's only six pieces. So they're putting on all their stuff. They're strapping on the belt. They got on all this stuff and they ain't got no instruction on how to use it. <laughs> just, just run around here playing make-believe. <laughs> but the greatest of these weapons is the sword. That's the one that you can use. All the rest are defensive. This is the only weapon that you have that is offensive. If somebody comes at you sideways, you're supposed to use the word to put them back in line. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with the rod of iron. We covered that. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That is what is taking place in Revelation 14. We've been in this chapter for about four weeks now, and it's all been building up to this amazing picture of Christ. But we read a little bit earlier, we read, here is the patience and the faith of the saints. That's in chapter 14. When you start seeing people get plucked, what do you do? What, what gets plucked? Grapes get plucked. People start getting plucked they're going to be going somewhere and something is going to happen to them but praise god it does not come near to us for what reason is it because we have faith they have faith too what what is it what's the reason because we keep the commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight amen amen that is the end of chapter 14 next week lord willing we will be getting into revelation chapter 15 I advise you to go home and read it in advance if you're going to be here next week. That way you know what we are talking about and discussing. This is the message that I have for you.